now. In the meantime, let's get into some of the other bits and bobs uh, kicking about tonight. Our Friday panel, join us. Looking forward to this one uh, this week to get into some of the big stories. Uh, Georgia Gilhurley joins us, an activist and political journalist, uh, and uh, Bill Burkett as well, uh, who is a political reporter at Reaction. Bill, Georgia, hello, good evening to you both. Very good evening, Dale. Thank you for being on. Really appreciate it. Nice to have you. Listen, we're gonna we're gonna start where we uh, where we just left off. Let's just let's let's quickly touch on this. We've got quite a lot to get through uh, from the week, but we we can't miss one of the big stories of the week um, and the plans for social care and the plans to pay for them, which include a rise in national insurance. Georgia, how politically damaging could a rise in national insurance be? Can the prime minister, the Tories, honestly go back to some of those big Tory heartlands in the north of England and say? That they have prop they they have risen national insurance when they promised not to. I mean, in terms of those areas you're referring to, I'm assuming sort of red wall areas. Mm. I wouldn't necessarily call them Tory heartlands. I think that they switched a certain way because they felt that they had no option when faced. In terms of how politically damaging this could be, I think we've. Ah, uh, Georgia, listen, we're having a bit this of an issue with your line. Um, uh, just, just hang, hang fire there. We're going to see if our, our team can try and uh, try and sort it out and get a better connection with you. Bill, pick up on that point then. Um, uh, Boris Johnson has to go up to, and Georgia's right to say, not necessarily Tory heartlands, uh, but places that lended Boris Johnson their vote at the last election, and he's got to say, "Sorry, chaps, I put national insurance up." How politically difficult is that going to be for him? It's hugely difficult um, for Boris Johnson when he spoke in the House of Commons on Tuesday. Uh, delivering his much, you know, anticipated uh, health and social care plan, he said that no, that the coronavirus pandemic was in no party's manifesto, uh, and saying that it's the reason why they had to break from the traditional um, Tory promise that they, and uh, part of their ideology, that their core, basically the the fat right policy, that they must keep taxes low in order to. Uh, increased productivity and to keep the economy moving. But I do think this is damaging in many different ways because for, for one, as we've now seen in today's Times poll, Boris Johnson is now behind Labour for the first time and I think in 150 consecutive polls, which uh, I thought was quite funny. Matthew Goodwin, the political scientist, often likes to tweet about them uh, and now mm. it's just suddenly ended. Uh, but uh, this is all short term as well. There could be a shift as well. I think people can be kind of reactionary over this issue as well. But um... for sure, for sure, Bill, I, I wonder if this is this interesting point you make about uh, and, and and that was the line for the prime minister, wasn't it? That the, the pandemic wasn't in anybody's manifesto, and and, and yeah, that's, that's that's technically true, it was technically accurate. Uh, but this problem with social care hasn't come about because of the pandemic. This problem with social care has existed for decades, uh, as well. We know, and we're always going to have to find a way to to solve it and and to sort it. It's a bit of a cop out isn't it to point at the pandemic as being a reason for having to do this at this moment in time not necessarily so i mean norman lambert for instance the former chancellor of the exchequer um during the thatcher years during the latter ends of the thatcher years was defending the prime minister in the daily mail uh, the other day saying that if lady thatcher were around today she would have probably have voted for this tax rise and Yes, it's tricky waters for the prime minister head, uh, as well as his tax rise, you know, with what's happening in Afghanistan at the moment, uh, as well as vaccine passports. So it feels like as soon as parliament has returned, it's all been piled up on his shoulders and his government's uh, responsibilities. But mm. I think we should have a little level of sympathy when it comes to Boris Johnson, because social care has to be funded in some way, uh, shape or form. And, and even as you saw the, the cabinet backed boris johnson's plans and as you saw only five mps ended up voting against boris johnson's plans in the commons okay uh, georgia um um i think we've got you back um just pick up on that point then so but we're talking about uh, the fact that there was uh, this this line from boris johnson there was no uh, pandemic in in the manifesto uh, which is uh, which is a fair point but using that as a way to point towards rises in national insurance i'm not quite sure where the where the connection is um and, and if i am one of those voters actually i am one of those voters technically in in the north of england although not not one of those voters uh in in the north of england um but but if, you know if if somebody came to me and said listen i'm sorry because of the pandemic we've had to put up national insurance that means you paying a little bit extra arguably a disproportionate amount extra for this social play, uh, care plan I, I would list all of the contracts 
that have been handed out. A lot of them to Tory donors. I'd be listing the money that's been spent on test and trace systems. I'd be listing on the huge output to the amount of people who've become incredibly wealthy during the course of the pandemic and wonder why it is therefore an excuse for me picking up the burden. Yeah, absolutely. I think we can sort of sit here and talk about, OK, maybe this this rise is logical on some level. But if you're, you know, say you have a an average wage, you're sort of living month to month, paying your rent, whatever. That's not going to be the kind of things that you're thinking. You're thinking, how can I put food on the table? How can I feed my children? And also, I think there is, yeah, there's a double standard when you look at sort of how certain corporations and certain people with connections to the Conservative Party have benefited from some of the contracts, etc. throughout the lockdown. And also, I think there's there's an issue with misconstruing the pandemic and the response to it and simply saying oh you know this is okay because of the pandemic that doesn't mean that our response when i say our i mean the government's response because we didn't have much say in how they responded unfortunately um there was lack of parliamentary scrutiny and there remains to be (laughs) there remains to be i suppose reviews into what happened on many different levels and i just think if you're an average person you're looking at how this is going to impact you you're not thinking about, oh, poor Boris Johnson having to decide this. You know, he is the prime minister, um, the cabinet. They volunteer to be in these roles. They know what can happen. They know crises can happen when you get into a role of authority. Um, and I think that that's people's concerns aren't going to be, you know, doing apologetics for the Conservative Party. And I think that we should not be so kind on how they've acted. Mm, OK, um, Georgia, hang on there. Glad we've got you back. Bill, stick about. We'll uh, we'll chat more next. Our Friday panel join us on top of that question to our Friday panel tonight. Georgia Gilhurley joins us, uh, an activist and political journalist, and uh, Bill Badkett as well. He's a political reporter at Reaction. Um, Bill, firstly, um, this is a significant moment in this story, isn't it? I mean, I mean, any of these sort of conversations we've been having earlier this week about Prince Andrew, as fanciful as they might seem, Prince Andrew plotting a, a return to, to public life as a frontline royal, does this effectively end all of those hopes? It has to, uh, I think, in my view, because if Andrew were to try and make a comeback while he's in the middle of being investigated in in this civil uh, case, as you said, it complicates things as it's not so much a criminal, uh, it's more to do with the the allegations and potentially any any damages that can come to to Virginia Guffrey. Um, But I don't think it could be the idea, the idea of him making a comeback is is remotely possible given that since that Newsnight interview, he's just been an utter and complete PR disaster. Uh, and given how unpopular he is, he's the second most unpopular member of the royal family, only behind Prince Harry. Uh, I don't think that starting to go to formal events or to be uh, in the camera, in the, in the limelight as he was previously, uh, before these allegations it, it, like, would be uh, helpful in any slightest. It feels impossible, doesn't it? I mean, it just the, the idea yeah. of seeing Prince Andrew turning up at the Royal Albert Hall uh, for, for a <laughs> concert with the BBC Philharmonic just feels utterly, utterly ludicrous. It feels a million miles away. Uh, Georgia, I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm almost I'm almost wondering here, but when we, when we sort of you sort of look at this in the context of what happens when uh, um, people are accused of doing bad things, it, it is an accusation at this point. It's an accusation that Prince Philip, excuse me, Prince Andrew uh, denies. It, it's an accusation um, that, that that he has rejected, and um, and he isn't convicted of anything at this particular moment. Like we said, these papers that have been served for a civil lawsuit rather than a criminal one. But should we be even having this conversation? Should the conversation tonight even be about the prospect of? Andrew returning to frontline royal duties? I suppose the conversation has been thrust upon us because it's entered the news. So I suppose if that's the reality, we should be discussing it. However, I mean, let's be real, whether or not he's been convicted of anything, as Bill said, it's a PR disaster. He's absolutely despised by members of the public. I simply cannot imagine a situation where it would be accepted that he would return to his normal duties all that the rest of the people in the royal family would would allow that really i mean the queen the queen knows how to operate as a monarch it's what she's dedicated her entire adult life to she knows that this is not going to work out even though you know rumors suggest he was at least her favorite son i just simply can't see it happening and i don't think it should happen and i think that okay it's an accusation but it's an incredibly credible one if that's the turn of phrase you could use 
And I think we've seen in the way he's acted, even if he was innocent, he's dealt with this in the worst way possible. And the way he comes across is that he's not innocent. And he simply see he seems to be absolutely unable to to accept that he's done wrong. He's made excuses, he's lied, changed the story, etc. Yeah. So it doesn't matter whether he's been convicted or not. Yeah, and obviously, I, obviously I've said at this point that he, he does deny those accusations and, and, and I'm sure that he would um, uh, w- would deny that he has undermined his innocence with his behaviour, but I, mean, I don't know, maybe maybe that is a fair accusation to make, although I'm sure, uh, as I say, if he was here, he would uh, he would refute it. Um, does, does that in itself... Look, I, I wonder if... I mean, I'm just throwing this right there. I don't even know if this is the right question to ask Georgia, but 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 are those things in themselves enough for him to 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 not return to to frontline um, uh, duty? Do, do, does that does this process sort of have to involve a conviction or 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 a guilty verdict in order for him to in order in order for there to not be a case for him to go back onto frontline duty? Does that make sense? Is there an innocent until proven guilty argument to be made here? I believe I believe in innocence until proven guilty. However, when you're a member of the royal family, your life and your role is completely different to to how normal people operate. And if the monarchy want to be seen as a credible institution, which in a way they're already failing to be seen as in 2021, unfortunately, um, I think that you have to get real. And whether or not he's been convicted, there's credible evidence that he was involved in, in these scandals. And also, everyone knows that he maintained a friendship with Jeffrey Epstein after he'd been convicted of terrible crimes. And that's not appropriate for anyone, and mm. it's certainly not appropriate for a member of the royal family. Yeah, and I suppose what you're saying there is that those are poor moral decisions. Uh, and and if we if we put parked for one moment the criminal element or the criminal accusations, uh, there are there are poor moral decisions that have been made, and that perhaps in itself uh, should be enough for him to have to step back from royal duty. I take that point. Okay, that makes a lot of sense, Bill. Um, does he go to America and, 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 and face this civil lawsuit? I mean, let's, there's two questions there. Does he and should he? Uh, yes and yes to, to both of them. Uh, you think, sorry, we... you, think, you, think that you think that he will? Yeah, I, th- I think he should, yeah. I mean, you, think, you, think, you think he should, but that's different. Will he? Mm, perhaps maybe. Will. But the thing is, is that, as we've seen in previous cases, the FBI have been asking for questioning. The papers have literally been put outside uh, of the different uh, properties of, of the royal family, um, he can't hide away from 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 the law any any further in this particular instance because there's such high public interest. But to go back previously about um, the point that Georgia was making about making a potential comeback, innocent or proven guilty, um, I pot- potentially wouldn't see him uh, going back maybe to royal duties specifically. However. There was a PR um, source, um, uh, someone within um, that works in PR that potentially says that maybe he should devote himself and said to charity work potentially in a country uh, like Af- in a continent like Africa uh, could be a better option for him. Although I do believe in the idea of redemption, I think his reputation in Britain has been tarnished so much already just by his public image obviously his appearance at prince philip's funeral was really put into question as well uh to the amount of coverage that he was receiving and and the reaction from viewers as well so yeah i i don't see how he can come back from this but when it comes to the law you can't hide away from it okay um interesting uh, we'll keep an eye on that story uh, any developments as they happen uh, on that news tonight, the breaking news tonight, that Prince uh, Andrew has been served with papers in a, a civil lawsuit from America. Uh, Virginia Guffrey filing those papers. Uh, um, her acu- His accuser, of course, um, choosing to sue him. Uh, and it, it is worth me reminding you and reiterating on his behalf, as he is not here to defend himself, that Prince Andrew uh, maintains his innocence and, and rejects those accusations. Um, um, elsewhere... A very different kind of story. I don't know if you saw this, uh, Georgia and Bill. Kind of an interesting story this week, actually, from Japan. Um, a company in Japan has taken the decision to ban cigarette breaks. It said to its employees, look, you have a disproportionate amount of break time if you go out for a cigarette. Uh, you're smoking, you're doing bad things to your health, you're potentially risking the health of those people around you by bringing uh, smoke in. Um, and also you smell. You're smelly. You're smelly around the office. And so they've decided to ban... Uh, people from taking cigarette breaks um bill let's start with you um is this a is this a win-win-win kind of situation or um overstepping the mark 
Um, I think so. Um, I mean, I just think the idea of banning a cigarette break personally just seems like a bit of a ridiculous idea. I mean, if, if people want to go and have one, they, they have the freedom to do so, understanding the, the potential health implications. But I do feel that with, with this particular instance, in, in a country like Japan as well, you've got to look at, well, why maybe is this being proposed in the first place? And the reason for that is, is actually the, the work culture um, in a country like Japan. So it, there's a coined term called uh, karashi, which is basically literally translates to death by overwork. <laughs> and and, <laughs> and that's many of the cases, 19 million people in Japan that, that regularly smoke cigarettes. Uh, and if you look at productivity as well, it's it's nearly 5,000 yen, which is the equivalent of like 32 pounds in Britain. It represents the highest point in, in two decades. Workers are literally being overworked. And as a result, they're going for cigarette breaks. And I think that restricting that right to, you know, step out of work for five minutes or during their lunch break to, to have a cigarette, I think is a ridiculous idea. Okay, Georgia, let's let's talk about this over here, though, uh, in the United Kingdom. So we don't have those, those elements. I mean, we are overworked and, and our productivity is pretty poor. Uh, overworked and underpaid as a general rule uh, across most of the across you know some of the key parts of the economy but ultimately i suppose the company could say look look we, you know you don't don't smoke on my time uh, you're taking more breaks and i'm helping you out here you know i'm doing you a favor uh, by stopping you having a cigarette break it's a win 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 mm, i disagree i think that it's bizarre to say someone's doing you a favor from trying to stop you from say smoking or drinking i think it's up to you I don't think it's up to the government or corporations to sort of tell you. And I think, you know, everyone does things that are unhealthy, but they enjoy. Everyone has fast food. Everyone drinks now and then. Some people smoke. I'm not saying it's a wise decision, but it's what some people do. They enjoy it. It's a stress relief or whatever. Um, I think that while I personally would not smoke because of the health risks, um, I think that sort of saying, oh, well, you're doing it on my time, blah, blah, blah. You know, five minute smoke break it's really the impact on productivity would be negligible and if you live work in london like myself if you walk around the square mile if you walk around lincoln's inn where the lawyers are you always see them chain smoking because actually in sort of tough professions it's what people do as a stress release stress. i'm not saying it's the best coping <laughs> mechanism but those are some of the most productive productive and some of the most lucrative career options so it's sort of bizarre to claim that this is, you know, really robbing people of productivity. They're just having a five minute break. I think all of us probably take five minutes, five minute breaks here and there, like go to the toilet, whatever. Oh, I take Maybe a lot more. Smoke, a lot, I take but... a lot. I take a lot of that, Georgia. What any yeah, any, exactly. any chance I can get? I mean, I'm, I'm gonna only work for three hours anyway. I'm only on ten till one for a start. But uh, but yeah, any any chance of skiving throughout the rest of the day, and I'll take it. Uh, absolutely. Uh, listen, Georgia, uh, Bill, nice to talk to you both. Thank you both for being with us. We'll do it again. Our Friday panel: Georgia uh, Gil Hurley, editor in chief. Um, uh, sorry, she's a journalist, activist, and journalist, and uh, Bill Bowcat, who is a, a political reporter at Reaction. Thank you so much to you both.